Elon Musk and SpaceX are developing Starship to carry people and cargo to Mars, the Moon, and other far-flung destinations. The system consists of two elements, both of which are designed to be fully and rapidly reusable, including a huge first-stage booster called Super Heavy and a 50-meter-tall upper-stage spacecraft, which is the Starship itself. In fact, Starship prototypes have conducted a handful of high-altitude test flights to date, but the vehicle has yet to go orbital. SpaceX plans to change that soon, as the company is gearing up to launch an orbital test mission with the system, which will also mark the spaceflight debut of Super Heavy. And those preparations are ramping up. Most recently, the new and upgraded Starship prototype, Ship 24, is closely following in the footsteps of Super Heavy Booster 7, rolling out to the launch site. The purposes of their latest trips from the factory to the launch pad are also largely the same and could potentially open the door for Starship's inaugural orbital launch attempt sometime later this year if the process goes smoothly. Both Starship and Super Heavy are powered by SpaceX's next-generation Raptor engine. The spacecraft sports six Raptors, and the booster features a whopping 33, as SpaceX showed in a recent Twitter post. Aside from the installation of most of the Starship's missing heat shield tiles, Ship 24's preparations did include one particularly unique step involving its payload bay prototype. SpaceX's first stab at a Starship payload bay has been likened to a giant Pez dispenser, which is not entirely inaccurate. Exclusive to Starlink, satellites will be stored on a rectangular rack that's assumed to operate like an elevator. As an unknown mechanism pushes two satellites at a time through Starship's slot-like bay door, the stack of satellites will feed downwards like bullets in a magazine until the full set is fully deployed. In late June, SpaceX attached a giant white box to a crane and positioned the box to interface with Ship 24's bay door, where it hung for the better part of a day. The test confirmed speculation that the box was meant to solve perhaps the most obvious problem SpaceX's unique payload bay design posed, which is payload installation. SpaceX's solution appears to involve using the deployment mechanism in reverse, with the white box conveying Starlink Gen 2 satellites through the slot, and the dispenser grabbing and lifting each pair up into the bay. It's possible that Ship 24 will have a handful of Starlink Version 2, or Gen 2, satellites loaded into its bay if it passes its next tests. Before being cleared for flight, Ship 24 will need to complete at least one nominal wet dress rehearsal, which is to simulate every aspect of a launch short of engine ignition, and one six-engine static fire, though several tests are far more likely. Starship S-24's test campaign will benefit significantly from Starship S-20, which survived extensive testing, and multiple six Raptor static fires in 2021. In comparison, Super Heavy B-7's similar wet dress rehearsal and static fire test campaign will be almost entirely new to SpaceX, save for a single three-engine static fire completed by an outdated booster prototype last year. SpaceX could attempt to static fire Booster 7 for the first time this week. It's unclear if the company will attempt to kick off Ship 24's next round of testing in the gaps between Super Heavy B-7 static fire testing. While unlikely, SpaceX is technically capable of testing Ship 24 and Booster 7 simultaneously. The company recently cleared a significant regulatory hurdle on the road to Starship's first orbital launch. Last month, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, otherwise known as FAA, announced that SpaceX could continue its Starship work at Starbase, provided the company takes more than 75 actions to mitigate the effects of that work on the surrounding area, which is a biodiversity hotspot. However, there are other such boxes to check. For example, the FAA must still grant SpaceX a launch license ahead of the upcoming orbital attempt. Adam Baker, the co-founder of UK Launch Services and an expert in rocket systems, picked up on the fact that Musk tweeted SpaceX will be ready to launch Starship to orbit in July, but not that it would actually do so. It first requires a launch license, he said, but the FAA was not likely to issue one until all 75 actions have been met. Starship has the potential to change the way we do space travel, and that won't come without some environmental consequences, so there is a weighing up needed. The more than 75 actions the FAA listed include things SpaceX can do to address its impact on air quality, sound levels, and access to the nearby beach. 
The company will need to provide more advanced notice of its launches to local authorities and the general public for one. SpaceX also cannot conduct road closures during more than a dozen identified holidays, and it can only close the road up to five weeks a year. The FAA also wants SpaceX to continue to monitor for changes to the local wildlife populations, such as the sea turtles that nest in the area. Among other items, it's asking the company to make donations to local wildlife groups and to monitor and adjust lighting at the launch site to avoid disorienting turtle hatchlings. The full list of mitigation measures can be found here. On a more worthy note, according to Christian Davenport, a space reporter at the Washington Post, the FAA says in a statement to the Post that it will make a license determination only after SpaceX provides all outstanding information and the agency can fully analyze it. In other words, even if SpaceX makes those changes, there is no guarantee that the company will definitely receive a launch license for Starship. SpaceX has to complete surveys, do pieces of training, and document most of the 70-plus mitigations. Then the FAA will be analyzing what they submit. According to Greg Autry, a commercial space industry expert, many of the FAA's 75 terms are very trivial, non-engineering requirements that can be completed at the same time as others. But he said Musk assumes everyone doing the job is a clone of himself or someone who is a genius that basically never stops working. I would bet late July is technically possible, but I'd put my own money on August or September. Olivier Dweck, professor of engineering systems at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also expressed that he wasn't sure if SpaceX could complete all the work in July. If it's not July, it's going to be this summer. Maybe August, September... If everything is completed in three months and the FAA is still not satisfied, will SpaceX still receive a launch license? Three months. This time really makes us think. NASA's SLS moon rocket will fly no earlier than August. A launch period opens August 23rd and runs until September 6th. And all we really know is that they just want SLS to get off the ground first. After all, citing a tweet of a Twitter account named Jaffod, other countries would give an arm and a leg to have a company that is as disruptive and ambitious as SpaceX. I am not saying skirt the rules, but government agency should show some excitement at what is about to happen. Be eager to participate in a once-in-a-generation event. What do you think? Do you believe that the government is actually covering Starship and all this red tape just to get the SLS a more or less handicap? After all, this launch system has been in the works for over two decades. I don't think it needs any more of a head start than it already has, don't you think? Anyways, with that, today's episode has come to an end. If you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. And as a quick note, if you have any advertising needs, you can contact us directly via email. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time. Until then, thank you so much for watching, take care, and have a good one.